Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome my father, Mitch Packle. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we take a look at the writings of the church. Before we get to our encyclical, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Agnes of Rome. She was born in 291 uh, during the reign of Emperor Diocletian, who actually had brought a lot of order to the empire. But then he began a persecution, the last of the great Roman persecutions, but it was also the most vicious of them all. And she had decided that she'd like to live a life of chastity and be a consecrated virgin. That hadn't really organized into orders of nuns yet, but th that form of life already well existed, and she planned to do that. Well, the Romans did not like that at all. And so to discourage her, um, they uh, dragged her to a house of prostitution to try to force her to lose her virginity, but various things happened that that was thwarted, so then she was martyred. And she died in 304 at just about age 12 or 13. And uh, they were pretty bad. Um, so that's, uh, that was a tough, tough time in the church. It took a little while for the church to, you know, do well again, but um, it wasn't but 10 years later that uh, Constantine made Christianity legal. Uh, he did not make, a lot of people think that Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire. He did not. All he did is decriminalize it. Um, it would be some late years later, uh, about 60 years later, uh, under Theodosius, that it became the official religion of the empire. All right, we are going now through Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. And you can get a paperback copy of this from EWTN's Religious Catalog. Uh, just go to our website, ewtnreligiouscatalog.com, or you can also call them, and uh, they will have their number. Um, I think it's 1-800-854-6316. And you can also uh, download a free electronic copy of Fides at Ratio if you go to the document library at our website, ewtn.com. And of course, we want you to be involved and participate. You can come to Birmingham, as these nice folks have done, uh, or you can also uh, send us an email question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com, or you can call us during our live broadcast, which is, uh, and the, the phone number, uh, well, just give you the time. It is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's the live show. And if you call at that time, you can call 1-800-221-9460. Or you can uh, call if you're local or uh, in Alabama, or if you are living abroad uh, outside the United States, you can call 205-271-2980. And that's, by the way, outside North America. You know, inside North America, it's 800 number works. All right, we are on paragraph 43. Remember a couple weeks ago, I had to take a break last week. I had bad laryngitis. I couldn't talk. Uh, so we had some questions I'd answered um, already for it. But um, two weeks ago, we were taking a look at some of the early scholastic theologians and philosophers. Now we're going to the high point of scholastic thought, which is the enduring originality of the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, too, about Thomas, I don't think he lived barely 50 years. He did all that he did in about 50 years of life. It's amazing. Amazing. Um, uh, he died uh, 
trying, you know, serving the Pope, going on a journey to take care of some business, and he died along the way. And he definitely has a very special place, as the Pope says, not only because of what he taught, and the content is phenomenal. Commentaries on Scripture, plus his Summa Theologica, Summa Concha uh, uh, Gentiles, and so on. But he also was able to use the Arabic and Jewish thought of his time. Now, Arabic and Jewish philosophers, especially living in Spain, which was still heavily occupied by the Moors, they were doing all kinds of philosophy, and their work got translated into Latin, especially two of the great Arab commentators, Averroes and Avicenna. And this was a time when various Christian thinkers, not only Thomas, but many others, were rediscovering the treasures of ancient philosophy, especially Aristotle. Aristotle did not really make much of an impact in the West because uh, copies of his books were not available. And I say this is one of the realities. Uh, a lot of times books just weren't there. They got destroyed. You know, when they didn't have a, you know, a copy of every book in every library. Uh, it just found what you could. And in the period when the barbarians invaded Europe, many, many monasteries uh, were destroyed, and certainly the pagan libraries were destroyed by the barbarians. See, and this is one of the things, a lot of silly people think that the church made the Dark Ages dark. It wasn't the church. It was the barbarian invaders who brought the darkness, and the church did everything to preserve ancient wisdom. And in the case of Aristotle, it was the monks of the Middle East who had preserved Aristotle. But they translated it into Arabic for the Arab conquerors of the Middle East, and then the Arabs brought it west, and that's why we got it from the Arabs, we got Aristotle from the Arabs, because the Syriac-speaking monks had translated Aristotle into Arabic for them. And um, then Thomas got it through the Arabs and through the Jewish commentators. Now Thomas had the great merit of giving pride of place to the harmony that exists between the uh, faith and reason, and that this sense is extremely important, that there is this um, harmony between faith and reason. Now, we've been talking a lot about that, but it's something that we still, uh, Thomas highlighted. He said that both the light of reason and the light of faith come from God. It's not that reason comes from nature and faith from God. No, both reason and faith come from God. Therefore, there can be no contradiction between them. And this is something that you see in St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Contra Gentiles, a book where he really thought some of these things through. Uh, it means the Summa against the, uh, the foreigners. Um, in Book 1, Part 7, it says, That which is introduced into the soul of the student by the teacher is contained in the knowledge of the teacher, unless his teaching uh, is fic uh, fic fictitious, which is improper to say of God. Now, the knowledge of the principles that are known to us naturally has been implanted in us by God, for God is the author of our nature. So yes, there are certain things that you know by nature, but God put the principles in nature 
He put the ability to reason in us, and we are able to discover those principles. St. Thomas goes on in the same section, uh, on the Summa Contra Gentiles. These principles, therefore, are also contained by the divine wisdom. Hence, whatever is opposed to them is opposed to the divine wisdom and therefore cannot come from God. That which we hold by faith as divinely revealed, therefore, cannot be contrary to our natural knowledge. So this is something very important. And um, this is a great principle that he lays out. Now, on a more radical basis, St. Thomas Aquinas recognized that nature, which is the proper concern of philosophy, that's what philosophy tries to do, is understand nature. And in fact, in older times, they usually included what we call science as part of philosophy. So it would be the philosophy of uh, physics and so on, but we would just call it a physics course. However, he would recognize that nature could contribute to the understanding of divine revelation. If you learn things from nature, you can understand what God has revealed. Now, that really should be no surprise to any Catholic at all. We are well familiar with the importance of Jesus our Lord using parables based on nature. Your faith the size of a mustard seed, a treasure hidden in a field, a pearl of great price, a seed in a field, all sorts of things. And so it helps us understand. And St. Thomas said, therefore, faith has no fear of reason, but seeks it out and has trust, trust in it. We trust reason. It's a good thing. And we've been saying that throughout this encyclical. But St. Thomas certainly was one of the theologians to really bring that principle to the fore, that faith does not fear reason, but seeks it out and has trust in it. Just as grace builds on nature and brings nature to fulfillment. And again, um, this is something that St. Thomas taught in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, uh, question one, um, uh, uh, section eight to number two, where it says, sacred doctrine makes use even of human reason, not indeed to prove faith, for thereby the, um, uh, the merit of faith would come to an end. But faith and reason together make clear all the things that are put forward in this doctrine. Since, the, uh, since therefore grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. Natural reason should minister to faith as the natural bent of the will ministers to charity. So this is something where we see that faith truly helps reason, but reason also helps faith. They work together. And that's a very important point. Illumined by faith, reason is set free from the fragility and limitations deriving from the disobedience of sin. See, this is one of the points Thomas also observed, is that um, sin makes it more difficult to use your reason. Let's think of a simple example. Have any of you 
ever disagreed with your spouse. <laughs> All the married people are laughing. Some of them carefully because their spouse is watching them. And one of the things is that when you lose your temper in one of those disagreements, does that help you see your spouse's point of view more clearly? No. As a matter, so there would be an example. Now, when you lose your temper, that's, I mean specifically losing it, that's sinful. That you're just so blowing up in frustration, then that makes it even less easy to see your wife's or husband's point of view and to see the logic. That would be an example of how sin hurts the way we think. And, um, you know, uh, there, a good, another good example, the sin of drunkenness or of using drugs does not help you think more clearly. Ever try to reason with somebody who's drunk? Doesn't get very far now, does it? And I won't ask the drunks what it was like to be reasoned with because they don't remember. <laughs> Another faulty part of uh, being trying to think when you're drunk. You, um, you know, uh, you see this in terms of sexuality. People who are so caught up by lust tend not to think very clearly. Um, that's why confession lines uh, are long at times of the year. So this is something, that, that's a good, various examples of how sin clouds your ability to think. Well, faith helps you overcome that kind of imperfection and uh, you get strength to rise to the knowledge of the triune God. That's the role of faith. And although St. Thomas made much of the supernatural character of faith, because faith is a theological virtue, and that means you have faith not by your own ability, but by the grace of God. Okay? Um, still, the angel doctor, that, that's why the way St. Thomas's nickname the angelic doctor. I believe St. Bonaventure is called the seraphic doctor, while Thomas is the angelic doctor. Uh, he did not overlook the importance of its reasonableness, that faith is reasonable. It's not stupid. It's not illogical. It's very reasonable. And in fact, he was able to plumb the depths and explain the meaning of this reasonableness that is found in faith. Uh, I, it's so much a joy when I talk to converts and they begin to look at things in the faith and say, oh, that makes so much more sense. I didn't know how to include that. Now it makes a, a lot of things make more sense. And the more deeply you understand scripture, the more it makes sense and is reasonable. Faith, therefore, is in a sense a, quote, exercise of thought. It's one of the reasons uh, I go crazy when I listen to some of the news come, uh, the talk shows on news, and, you know, describe your faith feelings. You know, it's not about your feelings. It's about what you think, but they only understand faith in terms of emotion. They don't understand it as an exercise of thought. And that the human reason is neither annulled nor debased by faith. Faith doesn't make your reason stop working. It works very well. Uh, as you assent to the contents of faith, you will actually find that it draws out even more wisdom and cleverness as you think through the issues of faith. And uh, especially you know, keeping in mind that these are attained by way of free 
an informed choice. You know, that we use our free will. People who are forced to make an act of faith are not making an act of faith. That's why, you know, we would condemn groups like the Teutonic Knights who tried to force Lithuanian people to become Catholics. And it was the Catholic King of Poland who united with the pagan Lithuanians against the Teutonic Knights because it was wrong to try to force the Lithuanians to become Catholic. And in fact, later on they became Catholic when they saw the Catholics helped them and didn't want to threaten them to cut off their heads. Now, for this reason, the church is justified in consistently proposing St. Thomas as a master of thought and a model of the right way to do theology. So we, look, we uh, very much want to recall what Pope Paul VI uh, had written about St. Thomas on the uh, seventh centenary of the death of St. Thomas. As a matter of fact, remember, uh, I remember well because I was in, uh, studying theology uh, in the year that they had this big year-long celebration of the 700th anniversary of Thomas and his thought. And this was uh, by Paul VI in a document called Lumen Ecclesiae, which means Light of the Church, paragraph 8. He said, St. Thomas was undoubtedly very bold in the pursuit of the truth. He showed great liberty of spirit in dealing with new questions and the intellectual honesty characteristic of those who, while not permitting any contamination of Christian truth by a secularist philosophy, refuse to reject such philosophies a priori and without examination. So we don't water down the faith in light of secular ideas, but we also are open to the secular ideas if they say something that is true. So he goes on. In the history of Christian thought, therefore, St. Thomas is regarded as a pioneer on the new road to be traveled thenceforth by all philosophers and scientists. So this is uh, you know, something that he set forth as a model. And I remember taking a course in the contemporary the uh, Thomist theologians uh, back in 75, because Thomas set the way for doing theology. Pope Paul VI continued on, the teaching in which Thomas gave the prophetic answer of genius to the question of the new relation between faith and reason rests on a harmonization of the world's secularity with the radical demands of the gospel. He thus avoided the unnatural tendency to despise the world and its values, while at the same time not betraying in any way the basic inflexible principles governing the supernatural order. So that he didn't hate the world. As a matter of fact, his teacher, uh, St. Albert the Great, was a fantastic theologian uh, and student of science. I think St. Albert is the patron saint of scientists because he did as much experimentation as he knew how to do given the limitations of science in the 13th century. But, you know, they, they, neither Thomas nor Albert the Great saw that there was any uh, inconsistency between studying nature and the world and having faith. They go together, and we need to learn together. Continues on in paragraph 44.1. Another of the great insights of St. Thomas Aquinas was his perception of the role of the Holy Spirit in the process by which knowledge matures into wisdom. Now, this is very important. Knowledge is not the same as wisdom. Knowledge is knowing facts, which is good. 
Wisdom is being able to make sense out of those facts, make them relevant and use them. So St. Thomas wrote, uh, again, in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, question one, uh, further, this doctrine is acquired by study, whereas wisdom is acquired by God's inspiration, so that it is numbered among the gifts of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11, verse 2. Uh, so wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. And this is something very important. God doesn't just want us to know things. A computer knows data in a way. A computer can record more information than I can. However, it has no wisdom. We are to understand data, and the Holy Spirit helps us gain wisdom. So um, his theology allows, uh, that is Thomas's theology, allows us to understand what is distinctive of wisdom in the close link between faith and knowledge of the divine. So wisdom comes very much to play. This wisdom comes to know by way of, this is a big word, connaturality. Connaturality. Now that means certain things are connatural to you. Um, very simple examples of connaturality. Um, eating is connatural to an animal that has a mouth and a stomach. It's normal to eat. It's as part of, it fits the nature of an animal with a mouth and a stomach to eat. It does not fit the nature of a rock. A rock does not have any possibility of eating. It's not connatural to a rock. Doesn't mean a rock is bad, just it's not connatural for it to eat. And we also learn by various experiences. Take a look at the book of Proverbs, see things, for instance, where it's, it says, look at the ant and see how the ant does not sit around and is lazy all summer, but gathers food. It is con and so from the connection from what the ant does to what we do, we can see there is a link between that wisdom. And so we learn from it. Also, wisdom presupposes faith and even formulates its right judgment on the basis of the truth of the faith itself. So again, we see St. Thomas say in the Summa Theologiae, in the Secunda Secundae, question 45.2, the wisdom, which is called a gift of the Holy Ghost, differs from that which is acquired intellectual virtue, for intellectual virtue is attained by human effort. You sit down and you study and you memorize. That's how you gain natural wisdom. Whereas the former, that is wisdom, is descending from above. As St. James wrote in his epistle, chapter 3, verse 15, in a like manner, manner uh, Wisdom differs from faith, since faith assents to the divine truth itself, whereas wisdom belongs to the gift of wisdom to judge according to the divine truth. So wisdom you know, is that you are able to say, all right, I know what God, what was it, Mr. Arl? Faith is the ability to say, I accept what God has revealed. Wisdom is then able to apply it and say, because I accept it, I can live a more integral life. Just as an example, if we accept in faith, God gives a commandment, thou shalt not kill. And we can then reflect that uh, also thou shalt not steal. If we, we can reflect easily, 
by applying that to my life and accepting that, I can gain a wisdom about how to live among people so that people learn to trust. I'm not going to kill them or rob them. And we can even go more. If everybody in our society decided, I will not kill and I will not steal, then we would be free. Think about this. We would be more free to walk around our cities at night than we are today. That in fact, not having the wisdom that comes from accepting what God has revealed takes away our freedom because there are a lot of bad guys who want to rob you and don't mind killing you. And I say that as someone who's been mugged multiple times. And when one guy was holding a knife to me, a passerby, saw the scene and said, stick him, stick him. That wasn't what I was looking for. That was not the kind of help I wanted. Uh, fortunately, the guy did not stick me with the knife. Um, but you can see there's some bad people out there. Whereas, you know, um, and all he got was $10 that I had. Uh, but, you know, it, it's one of those things all the world would be more free if we said in faith, I believe God as the author of good commandments. And B, there's a wisdom in accepting the goodness of the commandments and in living them out. That would be the issue. All right, we'll take a break. Come back in just a couple minutes with your questions, comments, emails, and those of our studio audience. So please stay with us. <laughs> Nice group of folks all the way from Canada down to Texas and folks in between who are here with us today and we'd love to have you come and join us as well. Um, if you can make it, uh, please contact our pilgrimage department. Their number is 205-271-2966 or you can go to our website www ewtn.com and they'll give you information about scheduling of masses, programs, uh, tours of the studios, and directions about places to stay and places to eat. And we hope you folks from up north uh, make sure that you get some uh, fried green tomatoes or a fine Alabama barbecue and all sorts of other good stuff around here. All right, we're going uh, to, um, by the way, just to emphasize how welcome you are. I uh, heard yesterday how on the radio the governor of New York uh, did not, does not want certain people and um, some of his political opponents, but also those of us who are pro-life uh, don't belong in his state. Well, you all just come on down here to Alabama. Uh, Governor Bentley said anybody who lives up there in New York and you don't fit in anymore, you can come down to Alabama. You'd be very welcome here. So come on. Uh, not just to visit, you can come and stay. Uh, I'll start off with a question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Good to have you there. And what's your question? Uh, about the natural law. Uh, St. Yeah. Paul in the second chapter of Romans mentions that the law is written in the hearts and we discern it by our conscience, and that is available to everyone. Sure. Uh, and that very idea seems of the natural law seems to be derided and uh, not at all accepted nowadays. Oh, that's very true. As a matter of fact, I remember um, that uh, Supreme Court Justice Thomas, uh, you know, uses natural law thinking 
in, in the way he approaches the law. And he just gets raked over the coals and made fun of and all that kind of thing. And he say, um, what part of thinking are you rejecting here? <laughs> I mean, that, because that is key to the natural law, is that um, you have to think and apply. So for instance, a basic way that applies to every human being is that you can formulate the natural law as saying, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Very simple. So I didn't like getting mugged. And, you know, uh, so I've, I've never mugged anybody else. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, even before being mugged, I knew I would not like it. <laughs> and uh, so I don't do it to someone else. Uh, I don't want to be murdered. And I don't know many murderers who do want to be murdered. Therefore, you don't do it to someone else. You know, this, this is very basic. Um, and so this is one of the things that we all have to deal with uh, and help people to think that through. You know, that, that's one reason that applies to abortion. Do you want somebody to cut off your limbs with a knife? and crush your skull. I don't. Therefore, I can have no basis for doing it to somebody else. If I won't do it, don't want it done to me, don't do it to somebody else. Just because I can't see him doesn't mean I have the right to, to do it to him. Okay. Now, I think we've got a phone call here, kind of a special uh, person on the phone here. Uh, it's Jeannie Monahan. Are you there? I'm here. Hi, Father. How are you? I'm well, thanks. I understand that you are the president for the March for Life Education Defense Fund. That is correct. It is an honor and a burden to carry that title. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet it is. So what do you have going on right now? Well, it's been a busy day around here. I just literally... We're, by the way, I, tell, tell our audience where here is. Here is Washington, D.C. Okay. And um, I just finished about five minutes ago speaking to a crowd of about 1,500 young people who are here for the March for Life, about half of them here for the first time for mm -hmm. the March for Life, which is really fun to see because this event has such an impact on people's hearts. Sure. Um, and we've got lots, you know, happening here today. It just, first of all, D.C. is alive with young people right now, with happy, pro-life, energetic enthusiastic young people. I could see it driving home from work last night. They started streaming through the streets, you know, with their smiling faces. Um, but in terms of events today, here we've had a law conference, a martial life law conference, and that has been wonderful. Then the youth rally and lots of different masses and um, groups are just coming in and getting settled, getting ready for the events tomorrow. Oh, great. Um, and and uh, you haven't had any government officials saying that pro-life people don't belong there now, have you? Well, <laughs> not in the same way that New York City is having government officials say that, if that's what you're referring to. Well, but it's actually the whole matter, state. The federal government shut down today, so they don't really have the opportunity <laughs> to say it. It's snowing here. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, so, that, so that they have no statements, that's good. And I, I just assume that, you know, uh, the, pe the good people of Washington are delighted to have happy pro-life uh, people uh, on their streets. And I'm sure they're enjoying every bit well, of it because that's I a nice group of people. It. Yeah, we're very delighted to have so many wonderful young people here. It's really such a wonderful event. Yes, yeah. well, that's, that's definitely one of the switches. I remember back when I was teaching high school in the 70s that the group that was most pro-abortion were uh, males between age 15 and 35. But that seems to be changing quite a bit, doesn't it? It does. Uh, the most pro-abortion group that I'm aware of now is um, more middle-aged folks, but young people tend to be primarily pro-life. Yeah. To the extent that the head of Narrow Pro-Choice America about a year ago resigned 
conceding we can't recruit the young people. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, this is um, why sometimes I describe such people as uh, philosophical geldings in spades. They can't reproduce. Yeah. Well, and of course, the problem there, it's not so much that they're not, you know, they're not doing a good PR, splashy, good campaign, but their product is faulty. I mean, we know abortion is bad for women. It takes the life of a baby. It's, it, it, built, it's, it enters into a culture of death. I mean, everything about it is negative and dark. Um, and so if I, young people know the truth about this. Young people can see through, you know, lies and rhetoric, and they, they know that this is the human rights abuse of today. Right. Well, thank you very much, Jeannie. There's so much to learn about the uh, issues of life. And you can go to their website, www.marchforlife.org. God bless you. And we'll thank certainly uh, Father, keep Father, let people know. Father, can I just know. mention one other quick thing is that sure. we, we now have a March for Life app. And if any of your listeners want to be here sort of you know like not actually be here but watch the march they can do that on ewtn and with the help of ewtn they can also do that through our uh, through our app tomorrow They'll, we'll have 360 degree cameras on our app so that'll there be you go. very fun excellent thank you for that that's good everybody gets to participate all right now we have another caller we have james hello james Hi, I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania, and I saw you in Erie about 1990 at St. Mark's Seminary, so thanks for coming. My, but my question is, this time of year, you know, every year, there's three major events, Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, a Martin Luther King Day, and a National March for Life on the Day of Prayer for Legal Protection of the Conceived Babies. Shouldn't we be explicitly bringing out the, these connections between these three events and hearing more about the intimate connection between these three very interrelated events? Thanks. Preach it, Brother James. I like what you're saying. Come on. Amen. <laughs> uh, Is that all you got? Because, well, no, you're right. I mean, one, one of the big issues is very much a civil rights issue. For instance, that Planned Parenthood has 60% of its abortion clinics in African-American na neighborhoods, even though... African Americans are only 12% of the population. You almost think there is a racist agenda. It, it just makes you wonder, you know, uh, because of course the founders of Planned Parenthood had a racist agenda uh, from the 1940s of trying to get African American preachers to get family sizes smaller. Uh, because some people just were not quite so desirable to her. So yes, I, uh, James, come back and preach more of that and start writing because there is an important element of Christians working together on an issue of life, people of all races, you know, working together for the civil rights of the unborn and especially being concerned for the attack on minority children and on children of color around the world. President Obama has been absolutely insistent on linking foreign aid to abortion and contraception. Everywhere around, the, well, especially in the continent of his father in Africa and in Asia. He's trying to force that on the Philippines. I know all you Philippine people who are uh, watching, listen to us, don't fall for that nonsense. Sure, he's going to dangle a president in front of you and promise you money. He's going to promise you, he's promising your president money. If he can also convince you to try and kill your children, mm -hmm. don't fall for that. His money is dirty money when it's attached to the blood of your unborn children. Remember that. And that applies to folks all around the world. And any administration that does that needs to be stopped. Uh, don't, don't accept their money. Don't accept it. It's filthy. It makes Judas Iscariot's 30 pieces of silver. 
look good. So be careful. We're going to have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Nebraska. Nebraska. Where in Nebraska? It's a big state. Where, where in Nebraska? What part? Mitchell. Mitchell. I don't know where that is. Uh, but anyway, uh, what's How your question? How about Scott's Bluff? Oh, oh well, there it is. I got that. Ten All right. miles. All right. So your question is? Have they changed the, not the meaning, but the wording of the Ten Commandments? Have they changed the wording of the Ten Commandments? No. Well, this is not an American history book that changes the Constitution. The, the church presents the Ten Commandments as they're written. So we've got them there. Uh, uh, is that what you were thinking of? Being um, Protestant for 40 years oh. and coming oh. to... So the, the Protestants have a different numbering system of the Ten Commandments. Notice, Catholics and Protestants and Jews all come up with ten, right? But the three communities number the commandments differently. The Protestant numbering that you grew up with was based on the way the Pharisees had numbered the commandments. The way that the Catholics numbered them was based on how the Jews of Alexandria numbered them. The reason for that was when the apostles used the Old Testament, they used the Greek Old Testament. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the New Testament quotes the Old Testament 360 times. Of those, 300 are taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done in the 3rd and the 2nd century B.C. in Alexandria. And th the Jews there numbered it one way, and the Catholics, because they used that translation of the Old Testament rather than the, the Hebrew, numbered it that way. Martin Luther, later on, then went back to the Pharisee way of counting. And it, it's, no, it's a, you still come up with 10. You still have all the same content. It's just how you divide them. And that, that's the only difference. But no words were taken out. No words were added. They're all the same. It's just that we number them slightly differently. Um, and, and it depends on which Jewish source we use. The Pharisees from Palestine, like Luther did, or the Jews of Alexandria, like the, uh, the, the Christians had done for the first centuries. Okay? Yeah, that's, that's fairly simple. We have another caller, Julie in California. Hello, Julie. Hi, Father Mitch. Hi. What can we do for you today? I have a question about Matthew 17. It mm -hmm. says that after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John alone up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Right. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Right. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? There were no <laughs> photographs, paintings. You are absolutely right. Now, first of all, think back. What were Peter and the apostles doing at that moment? Do you remember? Uh, they were watching and then they went... Oh, no, they were sleeping. They fell asleep. And that's why usually in icons of the transfiguration, you see them laying down on the mountain because they were asleep. Uh, not on... And, and there's a parallel between that and the uh, Garden of Gethsemane when they also fell asleep. And then they woke up and they, they saw. Now, how they recognized, it doesn't say how they recognized that it was Elijah and Moses, except certainly uh, that Moses was 120 years. I'm sure that since then he looked pretty good, but 
um, still, uh, there'd be that age, but also our Lord was there. And while you don't see any mention of him introducing, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, St. Luke uh, is in particular emphasizes Jesus was conf conferring with Moses and Elijah about the, um, his death. But the, oh, the thing that I've always assumed is that either Jesus our Lord had said who they are, which is the most likely thing, or they had a, 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 an insight from God, you know, a, a heavenly inspiration. And another element is that at the, toward the very last verses of the prophet Malachi, it says that Moses and Elijah will return at the time of the Messiah. And so they also would be able to assume from their knowledge of the prophet Malachi that it's Moses and Elijah who come back. Does that help? Yes, it does, Father. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Also, I'd like to point out, uh, every time I go up to Mount Tabor, to the Church of the Transfiguration, I point out that was Moses' first visit inside the Holy Land. Remember, he died on Mount Nebo. And this is the first time to actually see the country. It's a nice view from up there. All right. Uh, we have an email from Mark. Dear Father Mitch, I watch you, and I'm blessed with your wisdom here in County Kerry, Ireland. Well, that's great, Mark. My question is as follows. Why is there not a feast day for God the Father? Can we classify each Sunday as a feast day on a weekly basis? As the Father rested from his great work, and we respect and uphold this in honor of him in accordance with the commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day? Mark. Well, Mark, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, we don't sense, because uh, you know, of course, Easter and Ascension and other feast days are feasts of our Lord, Transfiguration and so on. And Pentecost is a gift, the, the feast of the Holy Spirit, but always in terms of the Father uh, sending the Son, and the Spirit to us. It's always in the context that the Spirit and the Son were sent to us, while the Father did not send himself to us. Okay? So that's, that's why we don't have a feast of that kind of action on the part of God the Father. But we do for the Son in His mission and for the Holy Spirit in His distinct mission to us. Whereas, one of the things, Mark, you pay attention, especially when the priest says the preface at Mass. It is always addressed to the Father and the Eucharistic prayers are always addressed to God the Father so that the missions of the Son and the Spirit to us are meant to bring us back to the Father so that instead of a feast celebrating the Father, He is the object, the goal toward which we tend in the power of the Holy Spirit through union with Jesus Christ. And so that it's a Trinitarian life that we share. And that's very important. All right, I just want to remind you to please be sure to watch E.W. Ken's full coverage of the March for Life. You can go to www.ewtn.com for a list of events that are coming up this week. And may Almighty God bless you and keep you the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, of course, I want to remind you that we can bring you the March for Life and the programs we do and so many things because this network is brought to you by you. 
So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we will pay the bills to come to us. Thank you.